So Shaded Enmity actually began in 2002-2003. I was not in the original version of that band. I met the bass player when I was 15 in high school. His name was Eric Hogland, and he was in a video editing class that I had at high school. And um, he was making a video, and it was he was using some War Hearts from Children of Bodom. That really is what, what got us talking to begin with. And you know, he had a band, but they had guitar players, and they were looking for a vocalist because the Shaded Enmity was just sort of instrumental at the time. And so. I went and uh, I went and auditioned for them, and the song that I auditioned with was um, "Goliaths Disarmed Their Davids" from In Flames. And so I did vocals for them, and then after about a year or so, the decision was made. You know, it broke off where Rob Steinway guitar, Eric Hoglin bass, myself on guitar and vocals, and then um, a good friend of mine, Jared Keller, on the drums. So. Uh, that's what uh, that's what became the very first version of Shaded Enmity, and that's the lineup that recorded the the album Thought and Remembrance. And then before that, there were a couple demos, but it was nothing that was ever that we ever pressed significantly. And uh, it was interesting because during that time, we right before the Thought and Remembrance recording. That was the time where I did an extremely bad drug habit. And Rob and Eric at that point, they're like, hey man, we're gonna kick you out if you don't figure this out. And I was very young at the time, 15, 16 years old, and so dealing with that was something in its own. So we did the, the Thought and Remembrance album, only put a, a couple of shows, in, and that's the funny thing is since we were in high school, we were playing it at bars and and they would draw these X's on our hands because we were only 15, 16. <laughs> Technically, we weren't supposed to be allowed into the bars to play uh, in the area. And so, it, you know, these were school nights. So we were kids going out playing at, at midnight. Uh, the last band on the bill playing in front of 15 people at in a shitty bar somewhere in, in Washington State. And then the next day going to school or, or whatever. So we um we did that for a little bit and then uh, Jer Keller, the drummer, he was also the guy who was our producer and he recorded all the songs for us. He was the engineer. I'm the great guy. Uh, but he made the decision to move on and, and sort of do some other things so that left us without a drummer. And that's the point where um, you know we all kind of went our separate ways and uh, it wasn't that would have been back in 2000 2005 probably and there was uh, then a huge break of for many years and um, in 2009 I joined the black metal band Inquinoc and there was a drummer named Simon playing in Inquinoc and oftentimes before Inquinoc practices, him and I would meet and we would play, um, we would just jam and play whatever. And then, um, you know, that's when I told him, hey man, you know, it'd be kind of cool if we did a different style and we made that Shaded Enmity, still melodic death metal, and, but just made it very fast. And so we started, um, I wrote, I was living in this shitty apartment at the time and I wrote the whole Like Prayers on Deaf Ears album. And I remember um, it was myself, Rob Steinway on guitar. Um, who did we hell that did we have on bass? I played the bass on the record. We didn't have a play bass player yet, so it was myself, Rob, and uh, Simon. And I remember writing the songs, and I'd send them over to Rob, and I'd be like, hey, man, what do you think? You know, what's your favorite? And, you know, we'd kind of go back and forth, and he'd go, oh, I like this one. We narrowed it down, and that's what became Like Prayers on Deaf Ears. And we didn't, being in Washington, um, you know, there's no one, no one was recording this style of music. It was just... Um, there was just no engineer or producer that was doing it, so we just found some random guy locally to do it, to record it. His name was Don Gunn, 
and Don Gunn recorded the Light Prayers on Deaf Ears album. And uh, he mixed it, and then a guy named uh, Troy Spector mastered it. And um, this was around the time in, in the MySpace days, and I, I remember we, we were sending the album out to a few places, and um, one morning, you know, we had zero plays on MySpace, and then one morning, um, you know, I woke up and Rob emailed me, and he was like, dude, we got like 10,000 plays overnight and the album was actually doing really well and uh, some reviewers got it and gave it some really good reviews and that's what really propelled that version of the band to just go forward and um, you know do what we were doing so um, that was really cool at the time because it gave us sort of um, a validation to what we were doing because no one in locally was doing what we were doing or anything so um that was definitely uh a definitely an interesting experience in general and uh doing the like prayers album um that was just that was a really cool experience you know i remember it was, you know, um rob and i both did the guitars and simon just went in there and you know did his thing and that's the way the writing process worked for some of those out of like uh, like prayers, for example. I'd send the songs to Simon, and I wouldn't really know what he's going to do, but I'd send the songs to him with a click track, and I'd say, do your thing. And um, after like prayers, I started writing and recording the Ifo Perdido album. And this one, um, this is my least favorite of the Shaded albums. Like, I don't like this album at all. And the, we uh, we went to record it, and I remember um, at the time we we went with Don Gunn again, and uh, his dog died during the recording process, and I, I know that it had a huge strain on him, and it, it just it affected everything about his work on the album, and then at that time all of us were sort of going through different personal bullshit things in, in our lives and um, you know he did he wasn't really into doing the album because we were trying to follow up to like prayers and I was just so disappointed that it didn't sort of hit what I wanted to, to meet about that and so uh, with that um, we just weren't happy with the final mix he was going to mix it and master it and so we ended up uh, that's when we met Aaron Smith, uh, and Aaron Smith was a, a friend of Jeff Loomis, who uh, Jeff and I have, we work closely, and I, I played in his solo band years ago, and um, he remixed the album and mastered it, and we were happy with the final version. I just that out of all the albums, that is not my favorite. Um, uh, uh, my, my favorite tracks on that album though I really like The Botanist the, so The Botanist that's about growing weed because at the time um, I was growing and selling weed and it was just it was a very crazy time but The, the, the Botanist is, that's exactly what that is about so that, that I think that one and A Crystal for Your Life that's that is another track that's one of my favorite because uh that song is about an old, old friend of mine that he had some issues with some gangs and he knew how to cook crystal meth and they kidnapped him and they held him in a little cabin and they made him cook for them for, for months, 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 months. Uh, so that's what that song was about. And, um, uh, so moving on from that, uh, that that's about the time. Um, so we hadn't really had um, a bass player uh, then. So we had uh, we got this guy named Zach. Zach recorded on the Evil Thirty Do album. Uh, it was me, uh, Rob, Zach, and Simon on the album as well. And, and after Evo, um Rob left Shaded to go do some other stuff and. Uh, it was down to, and as did Zach, Zach left. Um, so after that, it was just down to myself and Simon. We kind of went through some different different lineups, played some shows, but 
for the most part, it was just dead in the water, you know, and um, it, it, it was kind of time to do something else. And that, that's the time when I left and I started to go play with in Jeff Loomis' solo band. Um, we went and he toured and did some really, but that thing, that was really fun. I, I learned a lot in um, that time period of life. And um, after that tour, after those tours I did with him, I had a, a lot of inspiration to start writing. So that's when I started writing the Forsaken and Forgotten album. And uh, that album is, out of all the Shaded albums, that was my favorite one. So I started writing that album and um, the I remember I, I would write the songs, I'd send them to Simon and, and you know, Simon would be like, oh, you know, make this part a little bit longer or whatever. So that's, you know, um, I would write the songs, send them over and say, what do you think? And, you know, he'd give me some feedback and all that. And then um, we were like, okay, this is, we're going to actually record this with Aaron Smith this time because Aaron was doing phenomenal work uh, with some bands and um, he had worked with uh, Jeff Loomis and, and a few other local bands and so we, we decided to use him for this album and so with uh, with Aaron that was the <laughs> Forsaken and Forgotten album cost that cost a shit ton of money and by shit ton of money um, after all said and done, and the album pressing probably 15 grand. And you got to keep in mind too, at this time we're not a signed band. This was all coming from our out of our pocket, um, so that was very difficult. Because the the other thing too is at this time we were very eager to get signed, and so we were sending our our demos to hundreds of places all over the world. Uh, record labels just trying to get a record deal or something and you know we, we the, the guys at Century Media said it was too crazy and too fast um, they even said you couldn't pronounce the name so we were just kind of shit out of luck um, and so we did uh, we recorded Forsaken and Forgotten and um, it was myself Rob Jesse and Simon on that album and that album um, I think it's pro everyone who um, and, and actually you know what I'm sorry it wasn't Rob it was uh, myself sorry Rob you probably wrong just like what the fuck I wasn't on that myself Spencer Spencer did all the solos on the album. I'll, I'll talk about him in, in just a second. But myself, Spencer, Jesse, and Simon. And uh, we recorded that album. And the one of my favorite songs on that album would probably be either This Is Federal or And Life Was Great. Uh, this is Federal, that song in particular, um, so that song is about selling weed and getting busted and caught, um, cause that, that was a time in my life where, you know, I'd been arrested several times for what I was doing and I was looking at felony charges and I was going to court and doing all this bullshit and, uh. This is federal, you know, it's like, um, you know, the, the night is young, the lights are blazing. Um, there's just, uh, all my nights and my evenings were spent out just doing, um, just out doing crazy stuff, selling weed, you know, and um, 10 steps back and I'm falling again, you know, my eyes are bloodshot and, and you know, 15 pounds and I'm starting to sweat that these are all references to what I was doing at the time. And um, I was writing about what I was going through. And uh, even, you know, and life was great. Um, that was, I, I, I wrote that song 
And because it, I was going through a very difficult time in my life, and I, I didn't didn't give a shit about being alive, didn't get, and I was like, you know, whatever, life is great. And that, I, that song I wrote, um, and set, you know, Sadness in Summer Rain too, uh, that was inspired a lot by just what I grew up in and, um, just certain instances of pedophilia and and uh, I, I grew up in what was considered to be sort of a cult at that time and there was um, a couple instances of, of pedophilia and, and things like that and and it, it was um, I was just writing I was just trying to get everything out that I had in me at the, at that time and uh, Spencer Hodge who played all the solos on that album, that guy exceeded my expectations for what I wanted to do with the, the solos on that album. And Spencer did, he did an amazing job on that album. Um, so j j those are just some examples of, of what some of those songs are about. And, um, we, we really weren't playing live at this time. It, it, it just shaded enmity. It, it was sort of, it was just kind of dying down at this time. I was losing a lot of interest in doing it because I was, I had a lot of, of, of other stuff going on in my life. And it just didn't make sense to do. I'd lost the passion for doing music, for just doing any of that. And so, um, you know, just, uh, it, it, you know, we, 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 we kept it going and then I made the decision to just sort of stop doing it and that was that. But uh, the Forsaken and Forgotten, that album was, it was really cool. I, I really liked doing that one. The, um, the, the music is just, that album is just heavily based. In, uh, all of us were, at that time, were going through really difficult things in our personal lives uh, anyway. And I think that comes across on, on the recording. And uh, it, it's funny because that whole album was recorded, it, with the exception of the drums. That whole album was recorded, and Aaron Smith, he was our, the producer or engineer on that album. It was recorded in his bedroom. Even the vocals, uh, the drums were were recorded at a place called Fastback Studios. But everything else was recorded in Aaron's bedroom, and um, we spent uh, you know days and hours on the the vocals and the the guitars and everything. It it was. Um, definitely a really interesting process and when we released that album that got the best reception out of any album we ever had and it, it's it was funny too because um, for just being a local unsigned band uh, we put the full album up on YouTube and it's not uh, it got I think YouTube took it down or whatever but it made it up to 200 thousand something plays for a full album and, and this is just a band that didn't have a label we didn't have um, any sort of backing everything it was we were we were all paying for it um, so the, there's that was just um, I think sort of the the end of shaded entity after that we just didn't have the the money to keep it going and all of us kind of went our separate ways um, and then you know more recently uh, I guess I for lack of a better term got the itch again and then I started writing I started writing um, you know so the songs like Nina and Grand Theft Family Garbage Porn King and uh, and looking for home, and the, those songs, um, I, I know. One, I remember one day, uh, 
I messaged Jeff Loomis and and I was like, hey man, you know, I'm trying to get back into it. Um, do you got any anyone you'd recommend me to go and, and um, record some songs with? And um, Jeff messaged back. He was like, you know, man, I've I've kind of been getting good at doing this myself, and and I'd like to give it a shot. And that was pretty cool to to know that he was down after all these years um, to do it. So um, you know, we uh, we re recorded at Oblivion Studios, and. Um, and Jeff just kind of, he kind of brought the a little bit more out of me that um, than in the past on other Shaded Entity songs, and it was just because he's a phenomenal writer, and and that guy, um, you know, he's an amazing ear, and to work with someone like him was a true honor, to to be able to sit down and record with him and recording, and he's like. You know, man, maybe if you did this right here, that'd be kind of cool and whatever. It, it uh, uh, and on the last song I did with him, Garbage, Jeff, uh, he got, I had him do the solo and then I had him record some of the guitar parts and, and just to do a little bit of collaboration with him. That, so that was, that was really fun. Um, but, uh, you know, other than that, it, it's, a, a lot of people ask about, um, you know, hey, what are the songs about? I know I, I covered that a lot with, you know, this is Federal and uh, Sadness is Summer Rain. And, and uh, for the the Like Prayers album and Hijo Perdido, um, th those albums were sort of what I was getting out and expressing at the time of, of my hatred towards religion and um, Christianity in general, and uh, writing songs about suicide, and um, even though you know that's that's cliche, but this is stuff that I was living at the time. It just I don't write about stuff that I don't know about. Like I would never write a song that said I was scared that I had 15 pounds of weed on me, and that I was going to go to prison for five years, five plus more if I got caught, which I did. And so this is stuff that I live. So um, if I truly believe that as an artist, and when you're trying to express something, the, the when you've lived something, that's when the most emotion comes out of something. It comes out of you. So, um, the shaded enmity in general, it, it's its sort of just been this baby I've had and these songs that come out of me. And then along the way, there's been really cool people that have stepped in to, to be a part of the band. You know, Jer Keller drumming, Simon drumming for those albums, the work I did with Loomis. It's, it's, all of it sounds like Shaded Enmity in the end, um, and I, I still write about the things that I'm going through. And uh, so I, as, as far as just a general history of the band, I mean, that's, that's about as good as I, I have. I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, if you talk to the other guys and, and there is even, um, you know, for example, one guy that never played on any of the albums, but he was in the the live stuff, was uh, Stephen Chang. And Stephen Chang, he was like, he was a guy that I went to high school with, and he played on a lot of, a lot of the live shows with us, and he was like the little engine that could. Because um, he, he definitely, that guy put in a ton of work just to, to, to be a part of the band. And so he was a part of it for you know a good two years or so, um, but um, other than that, you know the just being able to um, to see over the years it, it's been this really cult following 
I, I didn't give a shit about Shaded Enmity after 2013 or so, and then I but I would still be getting emails and messages from people that are like, man, we love this album, or this album meant so much to me, or or this or that, and and you know those messages don't go unread. I see them. It's not the, like they just get ignored. But that, um, just being able to play all of that stuff, even doing it live, that was, that was fun, you know, but uh, I don't know if I have any interest in doing that again, but um, the, out of everything though, definitely the, the Forsaken and Forgotten would probably be one of my, my favorite albums. The, um, another favorite song off that, the What Have You Done Oxycontin, that song, it's on um, my younger sister years, years, years ago, and uh, got addicted to Oxycontin, and and it, it destroyed her life, and it did to this day. And so that's that's what that song is about. And um, and I know, uh, and, and another side note too is after, because uh, I get asked this a lot, it's about the having Laurel Dane do the vocals on it. Life was great, and. Uh, Whirl, he wasn't like a good friend of mine, but we were friends. Yeah, I sold weed to the guy at the time. And, it, and I always bugged him. And I said, hey man, I, had, I got this song. It's called In Life Was Great. And I think your vocals would actually do really well on it. And uh, I remember he's all, okay, well, um, send it over and I'll see what I can do. And so I, 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 sent, uh, I sent him the track and didn't hear anything. And, and I remember uh, I saw him again. I was like, dude, I'll pay you $1,000 if you sing on the song, please. And I'm like, oh, well, okay. And so um, the, we scheduled, the, the, we hadn't released Forsaken and Forgotten yet because the actual digipack of the album contained that track on it. So I told Aaron, the, the producer engineer, I was like, hey man, I'm pretty sure Whirl's gonna be down to do this. And uh, so Whirl, Whirl said, okay, pick me up from the grocery store. So I went and I met Whirl at the grocery store and he was looking at something weird on his phone and there was, cause there was a Starbucks at the grocery store and there was this lady inside and she was just yelling at him. And uh, it, I started cracking up and Whirl was walking towards the car. So he gets in, but I could tell he definitely was in really good shape. And um, we drove uh, over to Aaron's place. And we walked in, because that's where we we're gonna record vocals for the song. And he just was not in good shape at all. He, uh, I think it was a combination of nerves and his his health at, at the time and I, I remember too he brought his mac with him and he had the and life was great song and life was great song up on his mac and then he had demoed out some vocal tracks at his his house and and that meant a lot to me that he'd actually put in some work to it and he was just sort of stand there, just not feeling really good. And I remember Aaron at the time, he was like, uh, hey man, do you want a beer? And uh, World was like, yeah. So Aaron went and got him a beer and it sort of, it revitalized him. Um, but he was just, he was sick at the time and I, I think a lot of people knew that. And so he started recording the, the um, then life was great, and life was great song. And I remember there was, there was a few funny parts because Warl was just a, he was a strange guy. And I, and I didn't know him like amazingly well, but I knew him a little bit. And there was one time when we were, uh, let's see, we were recording the song and I was like, hey Warl, uh, uh, the vocal line here is actually uh, da, 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 or it was something like that. And Warl turns around and he looks at me and he goes, um, uh, yeah, um, I'm not going to sing it like that. And that was that. So, uh, <laughs> he, uh, 
That guy was his own character. And so we, we did that, and then that was the additional song that we had on Forsaken and Forgotten. Uh, but, um, yeah, I definitely hope this, this, this is, um, helps some people understand some of the history of the band. So, um, until next time.